Welcome to the Bible Forum. I'm Warren Sprouse. America is under attack from something called New Speak. Have you ever heard of it? U.S. Attorney General William Barr is receiving heat from a liberal Christian group because of a recent speech at the Notre Dame University Law School in which he was praising religion as a basis for this country's moral system. He said the founding generation were Christians. They believed that the Judeo-Christian moral system corresponds to the true nature of man. William Barr is a devout Catholic, according to Fox News. He went on to say those moral precepts start with two great commandments, to love God with your whole heart, soul, and mind, and then to love your neighbor as yourself. The progressive group called Faithful America believed the speech did not accurately represent all of the country's faiths. Now keep in mind, faiths as a term is used loosely to represent all religious beliefs, even though the overwhelming majority are not faith beliefs. They're works righteousness systems. Chief among them are the various Catholicisms, the Roman and the Orthodox and the Russian, and there's another one I can't think of. Also Judaism works righteousness system, Hinduism, Islamism, Confucianism, Buddhism, Taoism, Shintoism, Spiritism, and it goes on. If it's got an ism after it, it's got works with it. There are 18 major religions of the world listed, only one of which is a faith system. All the rest rely on what you do or don't do. Religious behaviors you must follow, which automatically begs the question of what constitutes faithful America. Faithful America reported that, quote, William Barr's October speech was one of the worst examples of toxic Christian nationalism we've seen yet. The nation's chief law enforcement officer declared that only religion provides sound values, then accused militant secularists of gleefully attacking religion, going on to blame atheists and progressives for mental illness, the opioid, opioid epidemic, gun violence, and more. They insist that, quote, vengeful remarks like Barr's twist Jesus' values of love and inclusion I've studied the Bible for 70 years. I've never read anything about inclusion. Well, maybe I missed that. The values of love and inclusion beyond recognition and give Christianity a bad name. They also claim these words violate his constitutional duty to guarantee justice to all Americans, not just Judeo-Christians. Wild assumption at that point that he would show partiality. The petition, which has over 14,000 signatures so far, asks the Department of Justice to investigate Barr's speech and remove it from the University of Notre Dame's website. So, can you recognize bigotry when you see it? Bigotry is the intolerance of opinions held by others. Secretary of State Barr stated truth, not opinion. And nowhere did he attack other religious beliefs. And for that, he was attacked by people who eschew intolerance. You can't write this stuff. Barr's speech specifically targeted progressives, but progressivism is not a religious belief in the classic or, definitionary, or, or dictionary definition of the term. Barr said, quote, among the militant secularists are many so-called progressives. But where is the progress? We are told we're living in a post-Christian era, but what has replaced the Judeo-Christian moral system? What is it that can fill the spiritual void in the hearts of, a, of an individual person? And what is the system of values that can sustain 
human social life. Now, despite the petition, it appears many Christian progressives, it's a contradiction in terms, I realize, believe the protest has gone too far. Christopher Hale, former Obama faith advisor, says, I'm a friend of Faithful America. They're a good group, but I'm not with them on this. The progressive movement, the left, we oftentimes swing at every pitch. And I don't know why we're going after this in particular. Reverend Frank Pavone, founder and national director of Priests for Life, agrees. He says they're talking about the defense of religious liberty, and it seems to me they're taking away some religious liberty from Attorney General Barr. I mean, religious liberty does not mean that everything everybody says has to be somehow neutral or given equal time to every religion under the sun. Now you have to note that the Department of Justice has yet to investigate or comment on that speech. I doubt that they will. But it reminded me of something. If you're under the age of 50, you probably don't recognize the phrase. 1984. George Orwell wrote the book. I think it was either the last or the next to the last book he wrote before he died. It's a book, a book about the future written in the early 1940s published in 1949. It's really a nightmarish vision of totalitarian bureaucratic world, a totalitarian bureaucratic world, and one man's attempt to find individuality. His vision is being fulfilled in the ultra-liberal philosophy and policies of the progressive wing. For example, a pro-choice organization ignited a social media debate last week with a new campaign claiming abortion is an act of love and selflessness. The group calling themselves Abortion Actually campaigned by the, take that back, a campaign called Abortion Actually by the National Women's Law Center is intended to reframe the conversation and fight back against the assault on abortion rights in our country. What is abortion actually, they ask? And their answer? It's an act of love, an act of compassion, an act of healing, an act of selflessness. Now, I don't think that's in Orwell's book, and I don't think that he would be discussing it this way, but that's doublespeak. Yung Hee Park, senior manager of campaign and digital strategies for the National Women's Law Center, wrote a blog explaining the usage of the words. He said, if you've had an abortion or are thinking about getting an abortion, we see your love. Love for yourself, love for others. Didn't mention the baby. We see your healing and the healing of your communities. We see your self-preservation and your selflessness. We see your compassion and we love you. Now, if that's not doublespeak, <laughs> then we have to redefine the term. Another person wrote, I had my abortions out of compassion and kindness. I knew I couldn't care for the children. They would suffer. Now, it's interesting to note that most people on social media question the campaign's logic. Clearly, this issue is not going to be resolved to everyone's satisfaction. But getting back to Orwell's book, the main character is a man named Winston Smith. Smith's a low-ranking member of the ruling party in London, in the nation of Oceania. Everywhere Winston goes, even his own home, the party watches him through telescreens. Everywhere he looks, he sees the face of the party's seemingly omniscient leader, a figure known only as Big Brother. 
The party controls everything in Oceania, even the people's history and language. Currently, the party is forcing the implementation of an invented language called New Speak, which attempts to prevent, politically, prevent political rebellion by eliminating all words related to it. Even thinking rebellious thoughts is illegal. Such thought crime is, in fact, the worst of all crimes. As the novel opens, Winston feels frustrated by the oppression and rigid control of the party. It prohibits free thought, sex, and any expression of individuality. Winston works for the Ministry of Truth, where he alters historical records to fit the needs of the party. He is troubled by the party's control of history. For example, the party claims that Oceania has always been allied with East Asia in a war against Eurasia. But Winston re seems to remember a time when that was not true. One day he meets Julia, who will become the love of his life. But the party will not allow this, and they turn Winston away from her through torture and brainwashing. Winston's spirit is broken. He re is released to the outside world where he meets Julia, but no longer feels anything for her. He has accepted the party entirely and has learned to love Big Brother. Reading George Orwell's claustrophobic fable of totalitarianism is still a shock. First comes the start of recognition. We recognize what he describes. Doublethink, holding two contradictory thoughts at the same time, and believing it's rational. Doublethink, newspeak, the new thought police, the ministry of love that deals in pain, despair, and annihilates any dissent. The ministry of peace that wages war. The novel writing machines that pump out pornography to buy off the masses. Orwell opens our eyes to how regimes work. But now we can read 1984 differently. We are well beyond the 1940s. We use it to measure where we are, our nations, and the world we've gotten on the road map to the hell that Orwell described. Was Orwell prophetic? Possibly. But stirring, moving, creative, undeniable, and helpful. A book published on the 8th of June, 1949, written out of the battered landscape of total war in a nation hungry, tired, and gray feels more relevant than ever before because of Orwell's 1984. And that book should awaken us and arm us. Orwell's 1984 is our reality, brewing, being carefully cultivated. The greatest horror in Orwell's dystopia is the systematic stripping of meaning out of language. The regime aimed to eradicate words and the ideas and feelings they embody. The real enemy was reality. Over the last hundred years or so, the Democrat Party has routinely and exclusively used the term democratic to describe and to define their political party. And yet that party is probably the least democratic of all the parties we've ever seen. Instead of looking out for the demography, that the population at large, it's been autocratic, using the poor and marginalized people groups, cultivating the young through our so-called public school system. The Democrat Party had no time for the black population all through the de Depression and World War II until it had no choice. Not until the race riots of the 1950s did Democrats have any concern for black folks. And history shows us why. Democrat Lyndon Johnson saw the political value in pandering to this segment of society. With his great society, Democrats carved out a political winner. Then came over 50 years of overt pandering to the black community beginning with Johnson's Great Society, 
1965, the total elimination of poverty and racial injustice. That whole concept elevated the Democrat Party. But it was pandering. It wasn't providing. President Trump has done more for the black community in two years than the Democrats have done in the last 75 years. In 1981, President Reagan, a Republican, inherited an escalating black unemployment rate from Jimmy Carter, a Democrat. An unemployment rate that would top out at 20 percent. Reagan would lower it to nine. Bill Clinton would be the only 20th century president, Democrat, to put pe black people to work at 6 percent unemployment in the year 2000. But toward the end of his term, the unemployment among black Americans began to rise. President George W. Bush put black people back to work with the lowest unemployment rate since the early Clinton years of 6.8% in 2007. In 2008, Barack Obama inherited an unemployment rate of 8.3. He would manage to push that up to the second highest rate in the 20th century, 18.1%. Trump has brought it down to 5.1%, and he's only been in office two years. But none of this matters to the media. None of it matters to the education system or to the Washington machine. Trump's an outsider. Trump's a troublemaker. He doesn't do things our way. He has to go. 1984, the book, predicted this sort of autocratic system which seeks to hold people in social financial slavery. No wonder the book has been banned in communist and autocratic countries. History repeats itself and people understand it. It's just the average American who doesn't. Probably because they don't read. They don't think very much either. They're too busy. Huh? Welcome to the end of the age.